something during the prayer time or um, have a comment at other times. So, yeah. so just uh, want you to know that you will be on mute and Barbara and Jeff will have to take themselves off of mute for the rest of the meeting. So let us continue with our service as we join in the call to worship. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending its roots by the stream. It shall not, it shall not fear, fear when heat comes, and its leaves, and its leaves shall, shall stay green. In, in the year of drought, it is, it is not anxious, and it, it does not cease to bear fruit. Plant us by that stream, O Lord. Amen. And I believe it's to him now. My wife took my Lord, I want to be a Christian. So let's move on now to a time of prayer as to join in the congregational prayer as it's printed in your bulletin or in your time of uh, in your elements that came out earlier in the week for you. So let's let us pray. Oh God, our Lord, water us with your water of life, which flows from your throne in heaven. Give us roots that will drink up that water and grow us into trees of righteousness. 
Slay God our thirst for you with your life-giving stream. And when the rain stops around us, keep your stream flowing from unseen springs. For you, O oh Lord, have resources beyond our seed, blessings beyond our expectations, and grace above our deserving. You are God, and you are love for us, and your love for us can never be earned by our actions. Yet you love us without God more than we could ever think or imagine. Love us so we know it, O oh Lord. Water and feed our hunger for you, that we may never know the anxiety of life. In the name of Jesus, the only Son we pray. Amen. And as we continue on prayer, I will ask if there are any um, uh, needs that have arisen this week or any changes in our prayer list that need to be emphasized. We have one. We have one, Janet says. Oh, actually, yes. It's Michael right next door yes. lost his mother suddenly. Yes. Um, we have Michael Don Levy, one of our neighbors who lost his mother this week. Suddenly, and he's very close to his mom. And then Doug down the hall died. Suddenly. And another neighbor, Doug, uh, was found uh, deceased in his apartment suddenly. Eight years old. Two neighbors, and I think most of us are aware that uh, Harold Weiss has been um, translated to heaven. Uh, and I got word late this week that Dick Knight, who is on Cindy McGovern's list, has also passed. So heaven is growing by leaps and bounds here this week, it seems. Well, I do have a joy to share. Sure. Um, it's been two years and uh, Christopher is doing fantastic. Okay. Two years since the transplant? Yep. Oh. Heaven's Amen. not ready for him yet. Amen. <laughs> Lori, what did he have transplanted? Um, his liver, kidney, and hepatic artery. Wow. Hmm. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, he, he's a miracle. I would say the unfortunate part is with all the medications and everything um he's had to have all of his teeth removed oh. all of his what teeth oh my goodness well i guess that's a small price to pay yeah at least you can uh, replace them as well. yep as i well know <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to um, bring up uh, my cousin, Lisa, who was in a car accident on Friday. She was hit head on. And she said, had she not been, she had left her house seconds sooner, she wouldn't have been here. So she's feeling very, very blessed this morning. Okay. Accident survivor. Who's that? Are there others? I would ask for prayers for Glenn Chambliss, who is my daughter's father-in-law. He has been in the hospital for a couple of weeks, but has lots of treatments and things that still have to be done. So he's well. So I would like to remember him in prayer. Okay, Glenn Chandler in the hospital. Well, he's home now, but he's, he's still home. has an IV and all kinds of stuff. Oh, okay. Home now, but still in treatment. Right.
All right, then uh, let us continue in a spirit of prayer as I see no other additions. Well, I think we should thank God. We've been here safely. Uh, okay, well, yeah, I suppose we could do that. Um, Janet wants to celebrate our uh, safe return or safe transportation to and from Florida, I guess. But, uh, and I didn't die. <laughs> <laughs> That's a blessing. <laughs> yeah, she seems to have overcome her fear of flying suddenly. Really? <laughs> Mostly, I mean. <laughs> so let us continue in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we sure do thank you for your presence with us this morning. We thank you for your Son and your sent to be with us in our lives and for the Holy Spirit who flows both from you and from Jesus to us. We thank you that uh, you are with us in all of our joys and certainly in all of our sorrows as well. We, um, we thank you for your presence, especially with those who have suffered loss this week for Mike and has lost his mother and for the family of Doug down the hall who uh, passed away suddenly. And we thank you for those uh, the family of Dick Knight, uh, including Dora and all of the other family, and, uh, and certainly the uh, family of Harold, including Suzanne. And, um, and we, we praise you for uh, your presence with us as we traveled this past week. Uh, well, now it's, it's been a week since we got back. So praise, praise you, Lord, for your presence with us during the flight and the bad weather, during all the delays and cancellations, and, uh, and we just thank you for all of your presence with us and for all of the fellow travelers with us. And Lord, we lift up today the uh, friend Chandler, who is, uh, has been hospitalized and is now home, but still in treatment. And we ask for your presence with him. Uh, and we thank you for Lisa, who survived a head-on collision and, and is praising you for her life. Lord, we also celebrate uh, an anniversary for Christopher, two years uh, out from his transplants, which have kept him going and um, have kept him with us and in, uh, with a sense of joy and uh, all the ways that you've provided for him up to the uh, yeah, up to the um, transplant, uh, to the initial one, and, and into the second one, and, and now on from there. And Lord, we celebrate those who are celebrating this week. Um, we think especially Janet and I of our upcoming anniversary on Wednesday, uh, celebrating 42 years together. Mm -hmm. We praise you, Lord, for that time and for all the future time that you have in store for us. We thank you and praise you for all that you continue to do for us, for us personally in this household and for all of those in our church and community. And we thank you for your love and your grace, which carries us on and through this life. In Jesus' name we pray. Indeed, the Jesus who taught his disciples to pray, and we continue in that tradition, saying together, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now Jeff will share a time of offering in music. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the um, life you give us to lead. We thank you for all of the ways that you supply for our wants and needs. And Lord, we thank you for the ability and the desire to return our offerings to you in all of your glory and majesty. We thank you and praise you. Amen. Now let us return to the gospel of the Lord. As we look at the gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 17 through 26, as um, we hear about some of the um, lessons that Jesus taught his disciples. So Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 17, he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Mm -hmm. 
blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. So now we turn again to Jeff and Barbara as they lead us in only trust. <clears throat> Turn to the New Testament scriptures, the letter of Paul to the church in Corinth. Now, Paul is writing this book of Corinthians to the church that grew there and had some questions about how to live a Christian life. He addressed several concerns they had about various things, like marriage and family life. Um, about wrong teaching that had crept into the church and other issues that had divided the church and made it less effective in its ministry. In the beginning of this chapter, which we read last week, Paul emphasized the resurrection of Christ. For all had heard, as it says in the notes in my Bible, that some spiritual persons there deny resurrection of the body. And they quote those, uh, note those verse 35 and uh, others uh, on the grounds of a Greek philosophy of an immortal soul. And, um, and also on the basis that Christians are already raised, which was another false teaching that had crept into the church. And as a basis for our resurrection, Paul reiterates that of Christ. In these verses that follow, Paul continues to lay out the significance of the resurrection of Christ and the folly of not believing it. So let's hear Paul's arguments for the resurrection of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? 
And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now the sermon today is called Fruit. Well, I guess the princess must have got an inkling of Gail's friend. <laughs> So what kind of fruit are you? A sweet fruit, like an apple or a pear? Or juicy fruit, like an orange? Or maybe a more bitter grapefruit? Or maybe you're more exotic, like a kiwi or a pomegranate? Or maybe more practical, like a tomato, something you can put on a sandwich. However, you think or to classify yourself as fruit. If you are yoked to Christ, if you believe in the bodily resurrection of the Lord and look forward to eternity with God, you are a resurrection just waiting to be happening, waiting to happen. It's not quite here yet, but it is in your future. Our Lord demonstrated the fact by his own. And denying the resurrection of the Lord makes God out to be a liar. And I don't think that we want to go there. Paul says here that we are most to be pitied if we hope only for this life in Christ's resurrection, which Paul calls the first fruits of those who have died. And Paul talks about re the resurrection of the believers as something that will follow the pattern of the resurrection of the Lord, a physical rising from the grave of the body you had in life. The Apostles' Creed, which you can find in the back of our hymnals, says it most plainly. And I quote, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. That phrase would come at least in part from this passage in 1 Corinthians. But are there other places where we see this resurrection from the dead in the body? In the Gospel of Matthew, there is a reference to the dead being raised after Christ died on the cross, where he says, then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At this moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now, Matthew is quite specific about the appearance of many people who had died and were now walking around alive in their bodies, which had been in the grave. They were easily identified as people the witnesses knew in life and knew had died and been buried. Matthew used the term fallen asleep 
which he also, also was a term that Jesus himself used when he was asked to attend to the very ill and he didn't get to the place where they were until they had died. The sequence here seems to pose a question about when exactly they did rise from their graves. At the time of Jesus' death on the cross, the graves opened among all the other cataclysmic events in the earth at the time. But the people were not seen until Jesus himself had been resurrected bodily, and they appeared in the most holy of places in the city, the temple. They were indeed walking around on the day of Jesus' death. What were they? Or would they remain in those open tombs until Jesus himself rose from the grave? Or maybe they were unrecognizable as Jesus was when he first rose. And people encountered him but didn't know him until he spoke their name or broke bread with them and their eyes were opened to the reality of his presence. Whichever it was, they became known in the temple after the three days. Maybe even Paul had been a witness among those who saw him. Whatever it was, it supports the phrase we use in the Apostles' Creed about the resurrection of the body. Now the Nicene Creed, another of those we sometimes use in the church, also in the back of the hymnal, is a little more vague about the resurrection of the body, phrasing it this way. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and adds, and the life of the world to come. Now the church leaders who gathered at Nicaea to debate and finalize answers to the questions and inaccuracies that had crept into the church through those years to the early 300s had many issues to address. Greek philosophy had muddied the waters, so to speak, in the early church. And one such philosophy was concerning the soul as a separate entity from the body and the only part of humanity that was eternal. The soul would live on while the body died and rotted in the ground no longer needed by the soul for its existence. Now, Christian thought, though, considered all phases of humanity together, body and mind and soul and spirit, one and inseparable. Greek philosophy separated some of the whole and rendered faith in the unity of life weak and the creative power of God less than spectacular. The philosophers separated body and spirit, attributing to God only the creation of the spiritual part of humanity and not giving to God the creation of anything material. The Nicene gathering of bishops met to discern the Christian beliefs the true nature of the theology of the church of Jesus Christ and address those philosophical errors that had crept into the church. One of those errors that they tackled was that of the separation of the spiritual from the material and the way that that detracted from God the power over everything we know, both spiritual and material. They settled the issue of resurrection by the phrase from the dead, seeing the example of Christ's own rising as the standard. His rising from the dead was in the form of the same body with which he walked about alive on the earth, yet transformed in some way beyond what it was in life. Now, once we get by the initial appearances of the Lord after his resurrection to people who did not recognize him, 
We see him appearing as known in the room where his disciples were praying in Jerusalem in the book of Acts. His substance was different in some ways because he was able to enter the room through a locked door without opening it. Yet he was there. And he appeared again in the same place when Thomas was with those same disciples to see the holes in the Lord's hands and side. He could be seen and touched. He could be recognized as Jesus. And somehow he had a different substance, a transformed substance that was able to work in the world in a different way. And these were the stories that Paul knew when he addressed the Corinthians. Paul had his own experience with the risen Lord on the road to Damascus, where he was headed to arrest and persecute those in the church there. He says here that the Lord appeared to more than 500 individuals during his time between the resurrection and his ascension back to God in heaven. So in his time, Paul had many witnesses to the truth of what he was saying. But this theology of a bodily resurrection poses some questions today, separated by so many years from the days of the early church to now. Other than uh, the few examples we have in the New Testament Gospels of Jesus raising some individuals from their death to new life in the body, and the example of those who had been raised after his death and appeared in the temple, we don't have a lot of witnesses to new bodily life in the intervening years. Paul notes that some of the witnesses, even in his time, had already died and been buried, but not saying anything about their resurrection bodily or otherwise. The hope of resurrection lies beyond life, past the time when one has lived and died. The hope lies in God, who is the author of life, to make eternal life possible in the body after death, that hope in the life to come. But that poses another problem, which is perhaps beyond our comprehension. For we all know that when the body is, is put into the grave, there is a process of breaking down the, all the tissues in the body, which end up then as natural elements in the ground surrounding their burial place. Eventually, there is not a body to resurrect. How is God going to do that for the millions of people who have died and been buried over all this time when there is no body to do it for? Well, we get some hints about the power of God in the Gospels. For example, when Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem for his execution, and the people along the road were praising him because of his wonderful works among them. The teachers and preachers of the day were urging him to quiet the crowd. His answer to them was to be quiet themselves. That even if he were to tell the adoring crowd to be silent, God could raise up replacements for them from the very rocks that were strewn along the road. So maybe God could raise up from the dead, could raise up the dead from the elements that the decayed body spread in the ground around it. I don't know how God works to get it done, but anything is possible with God. Jesus told his disciples that the rich cannot get into heaven because of their misplaced confidence in their own riches. But with God, all things are possible. 
Jesus is fitting a camel to the eye of a needle. I don't think we can ever know exactly how God works. But we can marvel that God can do anything that God wants to do, including resurrecting a body that has long since been dispersed among the elements in the soil. But then, what of turning the body to ash, as we so often see today, to a cremation? which amounts really to a hastening of the process of decay, which burial takes so long to accomplish. How can God find a body that was dispatched in such a way to resurrect it? Again, it is not something that can be answered by the human mind, at least not mine. <coughs> no, the resurrection of the body is something that must be taken on faith. And that resurrection is the hope we have for an eternal relationship with the God who loves us. God can do so much more than we can ever imagine or think possible because God is so much bigger than we can ever know in this life. But we can have the faith that God will care for us not only now in life, but forever in eternity. I love what the book of Ecclesiastes tells us about eternity. It says he has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds. Yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. A mystery, I guess we could say. It is by faith that we believe that God is in control. It is trust in God that makes it all settled in our own minds, though we don't know the how of it all. It is hope that God will work everything out for our good that comforts us in our end of life as we know it on this earth. Our hope lies in the work of God beyond our death, the work that will rise us up as God raised Christ from the grave. Paul tells us that Christ is the first fruits of those who have died. And we will someday be the fruit of that promise for ourselves when we go to be with him and look forward to our own resurrection to see him as he is. Amen. 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 Now we'll ask Barbara and Jeff to share our final hymn, Oh, How I Love Jesus. <laughs> together today and every day. Hallelujah.
Let us now join in our congregational prayer for renewal as it's printed in your bulletin, saying together, O oh God, God, you tell us, tell us that we are God. all God. a part God. of your body, each with a different God. gift God. and a different God. but all God. put where we are because you God. chose God. to do it that way. God. You have made God. us God. all God. different. God. Because you want us to be dependent on each other for our completeness. Give us the grace, O oh God, to accept that our gifts are for the building up of your kingdom on earth. And help us learn, O oh Lord, to be most dependent on you to arrange all things for good. For you are ours, and we are yours, through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Now may the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.